Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Derek Murphy. Hi Derek. Hello. How are you doing? I'm good and it's it's great to have you on the show. Derek is my cover designer but he's also an author and does lots of other cover design and he's an entrepreneur at creativeindie.com and he's now a speaker as well and is working on a PhD in literature. So Derek, mm -hmm. tell us just a little bit more about you and your background including your traveling lifestyle. Um, my first book I self-published probably 10 years ago on CreateSpace. And then I started getting my master's in Taiwan and also my PhD. Before that, I lived in Argentina and Malta, and I was kind of living abroad for a long time, um, studying and writing. I did a lot of fine art. I studied uh, fine art in Italy for a while, and kind of realism and figure drawing and stuff. Um, then when I started doing my master's in Taiwan, I started a book editing company, and that turned into a book cover design company about three years ago because I started doing covers for all the books I was editing. And that actually took off and it was a lot easier to grow as a business. It just people, when you're editing, people don't really share it as much. And when you do a book cover, everyone's like, look at my book cover, go check out my book cover designer. So it's it's been really easy to sustain that business. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that's a really interesting point because, yeah, people almost don't want to admit that they're getting an edit, but they're really keen right. to share their book cover. They won't say, my book was really bad and then this guy fixed it and now it's great. They're not going to say that. So yeah. they might credit you somewhere, but they won't really brag about it. But the cover, they're, they're going to be pretty excited and they want to share it. Yeah, and I'm interested. So are you actually American? Yes. You are, but you've, tra but you've spent most of your life traveling around. My parents were involved in Rotary International when I was growing up, so I met a lot of exchange students and we had exchange students in our house. So then I went to Argentina as an exchange student when I was 16 and for university, instead of studying in the States, I just applied to University of Malta directly. And um, University of Malta is a British system, so it's only three years and it's much cheaper than a US education would have been. Yeah, wow. So I studied philosophy and theology, and then after that I studied art and painting for a while, and writing, and then my master's and my PhD are in literature. Which is so cool. And, and why, I mean, because you're an entrepreneur, and when I think entrepreneur, it seems almost the opposite to someone who would get a PhD, which to me is kind of academia. So wh wh why the PhD? Um, I'll answer that in reverse. I think. A lot of people who are entrepreneurs, I didn't really start as an entrepreneur, I started wanting to be a writer and an artist. And so I focused on learning how to write and learning how to paint. And then I focused on getting into galleries or getting published, but then you have to learn how to build a platform and how to market and how to get um, followers and do promotion and that stuff is really the entrepreneur stuff. Um, and after I got into that, I learned that's a lot more powerful than just writing and painting because if you know business you can really do anything you want and it means after you make something you have the ability to make people want to buy it or to you know send it out into the world a lot of artists and writers they they can make stuff and then they can't do anything else and it's very difficult to find any kind of success these days if you don't know how to promote your work yeah which is a tough one for everybody <laughs> Yeah, um, and I think that's why I was doing book editing and now I'm doing book covers, but over the last couple of years I deal with, I mean, 95% of my clients, they don't know what to do next, so I can help them produce a nice looking book, but they don't know how to make a website, they don't know how to market or advertise or get readers or reviews, I mean, anything, once you have a product, there's so much more they have to learn, and so that's why the last couple of years on my blogs, I've been developing uh, articles about marketing or tools or you know ways to get the word out there because there's there's really a lot they have to learn. Mm. And um, I think I've kind of built up a little a bit of a reputation as a cover designer because a lot of cover designers they'll charge a fee, but they don't really talk about how to design the cover so that it sells books. Um, and so I've been invited to talk at a couple writing type conferences because authors talk about marketing, promoting their books, but they don't really know what 
kind of cover cells, and it's actually really important. Um, some people have been sharing my articles and advice, and that's been going well. Mm. So you were saying that you know you've got lots of articles and things, and I mean we know that book covers sell books. I mean that's so critical, and that having a cover redesign can make a really big difference. But can you mm -hmm. give us a kind of outline, like what are the trends right now for nonfiction and some genre fiction? Like what what's going on right now in book cover land? Um, for nonfiction. Bebas New is the name of the font that's on about 50% of the book covers. It's a big, bold font. It's like English Gothic, but a little bit more curly. Um, it's on like half of every book cover because it's really big and bold and it, it's clean and looks nice, um, but it's almost all the same. So for nonfiction, you basically want something really simple with one little picture in the middle or maybe like a little picture um, representing one of the letters of the title something kind of a little bit clever, but very clean, not very busy. For fiction, it depends on the genre. Um, but the mistake that most authors make is that they think of their cover like their book. So they're, they're thinking in scenes, and they think, I want to convey as much as possible to the readers before they read the book. So they, they want to show the characters and what they look like, and they want to show the, the scenes and all the objects. A lot of cover requests I get I like, I want to show these five people in this room wearing these clothes, and I want these 50 objects laid out on the table like this, um, which would be almost impossible to do, and it wouldn't work as a book cover, it just wouldn't sell. You really only have a couple of seconds to catch their attention, and the cover, the only job of the cover is to catch their attention. You need to tell them what genre it's in, and it has to be good looking so that you can communicate, this might be a book you might be interested in if you like this genre, but if the cover is nice, they'll read the description and then they'll read the sample in the beginning of the book, the, the look inside. So the cover doesn't have to do everything, it just has to get them to that next step to read the reviews and the description. And we, I mean, you know, you've done lots of my book covers, uh, pretty much all of them except one now. And the, one of the things that we've talked about is the having a person on the cover or having more of the theme on the cover. And, you know, I, we've gone back and forwards on this. I still can't make a decision on what's better. Is there a better or what do you think on that person on the front? I haven't proved that there's a better. Um... I've seen if it's done very well. I wish I could show you an in picture. Maybe later you can show the picture we're talking about. But I just did a cover where um, she didn't want people on the cover. She wanted kind of an object. So I remade her originals, and they look really great as they are. But we ended up adding a picture of a person anyway because it makes it a little stronger. And it's just. Um, it would have been fine. It's kind of like a twilight cover, you know, where you just have an object and a dark background. It would have been fine, but having a little bit of a person on the cover gives it so much more interest, and people kind of want to find out, like, who's this? You know, what's she afraid of? Um, you've only got, as I said, a very you know short amount of time to catch their attention. A, a person does that almost always better than some object because an object they just can't relate to it. So it can be beautiful and look nice and be cool, but it won't have that same emotional impact as a person. Um, so a lot of people, I mean, for me, I don't think it would, it depends on the quality of the cover. So like a person won't outsell a badly done cover, but a badly done cover with a person on it might not sell as much as a really well done cover without a person on it. So it's not 100%, but generally if you can put something some something of a person, even if it's like a, an arm or a hand or just you know a little bit, so that it's not just space. Mm. Um, what was I going to say? Yeah. Well, the, another <laughs> kind of follow up on that is, um, what differences do you see? I mean, I I would really like on Amazon and Kobo and all this the ability to load a different cover by market because the American market, like we've put girls with guns on the front of my books, which is appropriate for America. But with the German covers and even for the British covers, um, you know, having guns on the cover is not so uh, culturally relevant. So I wonder, you know, and you, you live in Asia where things again are quite different. So what, what is your impression of country or market specific covers? 
Well, I think you also said that um, Amazon said if it has a gun on the cover, they won't promote it in the daily deals. Yes. Which is pretty interesting. And I hadn't heard that before. Um, that's, most, that is a unconfounded rumor, but something okay. I heard on the grapevine. I think it could be true. Um, but at the same time, a lot of Americans like guns. And if you want to show this is a thriller, this is a dangerous something, you know, you could do it with a knife, but you really have to have something dangerous to make people feel that, oh, this is, you know, a spy thriller where people might get killed. And it's easy to do. I mean, it's, it's kind of a cliche to put a gun on the cover, but it's the strongest, clearest symbol of what you want to re represent for the genre. So it's, you know, it works for a lot of, for a lot of uh, types of books. Mm. Mm -hmm. But in terms of other, have you noticed any other differences? So, for example, um, I would my impression of Asian colours is that they're normally brighter, whereas, say, the colours that you might use in Europe might be more muted. Have you seen any other kind of cultural differences? I think that's true. I think American covers tend to be... My style is probably more American style, where it's very colourful and very bold and a lot of contrast. Um, the things that... Europeans publish are usually more muted, more reserved, more symbolic. Um, if I was speculating, this isn't going to sound good for Americans, but I would speculate that Amer uh, Europeans are more sophisticated and maybe smarter, and so the, you need something kind of muted that kind of appeals to their sophisticated tastes, but it doesn't have to be over the top, whereas Americans are used to cheap pulp fiction and bad TV shows and there's so much competition to get their attention that you really have to use something strong and powerful and almost cheesy and colorful, mm. but it works because it gets their attention. Yeah, I'll rephrase that in a more positive spin for Americans. I would say that British and Europeans are probably more snobby um, and more literary in their, you know, the, 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 the markets are very much ruled by what the, the traditional media say is a good thing. So, um, you know, you would see far more literary fiction covers featured on prizes and things whereas you know we know for example Bella Andre's books sell gazillions um, you know in, in America so it's um I, I would probably put it that way round what, what do you reckon? Yeah I think you're right um, the interesting thing about that the, the literary genre it's probably true Europeans think they want to be told what's a good book and they want to read only good books they don't want to read crap books but the covers for those literary fiction, so they, they're not as much like in, for a normal author, for an indie author, if you're just starting out and you don't have a platform and nobody's talking about you, your cover is an advertisement. It's like a free banner ad on Amazon. It's got to catch attention. It has to bring new readers to you. So it has to be really bold because you're marketing. It's, a, it's an advertisement for Europeans or even for in America for literary snobs that kind of cover, that kind of pulp fiction cover, they would just say, well, that's not a professional book. If it was a really good book, they wouldn't need to try so hard on the book cover because, you know, there would be good reviews that they'd be talking about in the newspaper. So, like, the, the more famous the book, the bigger the author, the less hard the cover has to work. And so the cover could be very symbolic or not have very much on it or not give away very much information, which is fine if you have a huge platform and a big media reach, but a lot of uh, there's a lot of articles on on websites talking about like these are the top 100 book covers of all time, and they pick literary fiction book covers, which are really creative and artistic, but they won't sell books. And I think the mistake is for indie authors to take those as examples of good book cover design because they they might be good design, but they won't sell. They won't work as hard. And you have enough problems marketing your book. You really need your book cover to work hard for you. Mm. Actually, I mean, that's the same issue with, you know, a lot of people pay, you know, you hear people who've paid thousands of, of dollars or thousands of pounds to get a really amazing looking website with all kinds of bells and whistles on it, whereas actually for SEO and kind of traffic, they should have just gone with with something more basic and, you know, easily designed. Um, you see that a lot, don't you, with big name authors whose publishing houses have designed yeah. ridiculously complicated websites? It's the same, it's the same issue. It's the same thing. Um, and I've just started talking about WordPress sites recently. 
I'll probably do that more because the other thing after the book cover design is authors need a website and they need marketing and they need advertising um, because everybody tells them you need a work a work website but they don't know what it's the same they look for the the best selling authors and they think well that's what my website should look like because they're a best selling author but those authors they're not using the website to build their audience or for marketing it's kind of just a place for fans to check them out and they can be very stylish and cool and interesting but for indie authors the point of a website is to put up relevant content that your readers can find so they discover you so that they can find out about your book and buy your books. Your website has to be part of your marketing funnel. And so it doesn't have to be well designed. It has to load really quickly and has to be optimized so that people can find it and it shows up in Google. And that's usually about having a lot of content. So a lot of authors, they, they set up a, ideally they would set up a very well designed, beautiful website, but that's not what happens. They'll usually set up a very ugly, very crappy website because they took control of it over it, kind of like book covers. If authors are given free reign, they'll kind of think of their website as their own little personal universe and they'll just put everything where they want it. But web design, I mean, people visit hundreds of websites a day and they're all about the same. And you need to have the right elements in the right places so people find it easily. Um, a very simple, white, minimal website is probably going to work the best, but you have to put on a lot of your own content so that you start bringing in readers. Mm. Um, I said recently the most beautiful thing on your website should be your book cover, and I think a lot of websites try to put a lot of stuff or a lot of graphics or a lot of banners or other things that are distracting. You want people to look at your book cover and buy your book. So your book covers. It has to be well designed, but it also has to be the biggest, best thing on your website so that people can see it and appreciate it. Mm. Otherwise, it'll get lost in all the other stuff you have on your website. Yeah, no, that's true. And it's interesting because I, I know what you mean. I think many authors, you know, and I say the writing is about you and the publishing is about the book and then the marketing is about the customer. So actually your your book cover design should be aimed at your customer and your website should be aimed at your customer. It shouldn't be aimed at you. It should be aimed at attracting that person. And I think authors struggle with t switching their heads around to, okay, so now I'm on the outside. What will attract my ideal reader. So along those lines, um, colour palette, because uh, this is something again that we've talked about with my books, um, in that JF Pen, my fiction side, uh, is pretty dark. Um, and we initially did a, you did an absolutely beautiful cover for Desecration with a white background. Um, and I love, I still love it, I think it's absolutely gorgeous, but in the end we changed it to a dark palette because that's basically fits the genre much more. It's less literary mm -hmm. fiction, more crime. So do you think that there are colours that suit different specific genres and so readers expect things? Uh, yes, and a lot of it is just basic colour psychology. If you look up, you know, what colours to paint your room and how it makes you feel, you'll find that like shopping malls are painted one colour and hospitals are painted one colour because certain colors make people feel a certain way. And so, for the same reasons, in book cover design, um, chiclet will be a certain cover and thrillers will be a certain color. It's kind of, it makes, it's what people feel, but it's also what is expected for the genre. So if they've read 100 books in one genre, 90 of them are gonna be the same color. And you don't really wanna be the 10% that's a different color, unless you have a very established platform and you don't have to do any marketing because then people will buy your books anyway. But if you are trying to get new fans who don't know who you are, your book has to look like what they would expect from that genre so that they can look at it and, and know just from the colors and the fonts without even looking at the pictures, this is this genre and it attracts my attention. Then they can look at the pictures or read more about it. Yeah, I think so too. And and it's tough because, you know, you want to be special, but actually if you're too special, uh, people don't, you know, like you say, you have this split second and if you're too special, they click click past you. I don't think special is a good um, goal because you don't want to be unique, you don't want to stand out. What you want to be is more beautiful than everything else in the genre. So you want to look at what's selling and look at those colors and those fonts 
but your cover should be like it should look just like them, but it should be more beautiful, more powerful. Because really, like if you look at a hundred different pictures of sunsets over the ocean, they're all going to be very different and unique, but they're all exactly the same. They all make you feel the same way. They're all really powerful, just because that image of a sunset is you know it works. It's strong. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to say I'm not going to use a sunset. I'm going to use some little thing that has meaning for my book that they won't find out until they are on page 105 because people won't that you know your book when you are designing the cover so you're you're going to put stuff like that's symbolic and it's meaningful but readers don't know that stuff until after they've read your book so they're not going to care it's not going to mean anything to them um you need to attract them when they haven't read your book they don't know what's inside you just have to attract them anyway and just a kind of question, like when you, how do you spot a bad indie cover? Like what are some of the top, the top three bad things about some okay. indie covers? Um, the top three bad things, one is colors. What you have to do, because you're blending a lot of pictures together, and if you just take any random picture and put them all together, there's going to be a whole bunch of different colors so your eyes will be kind of all over the place because the colors will, will draw your eye. So you have to put kind of like a color wash over the top so that all the colors are muted or it looks like one whole piece. Um, that's an easy fix that most, if you're designing your own cover, you won't do it. So there'll be too much stuff and then you won't be able to see what's important. You don't want to emphasize everything. You just want to draw the eye to certain things. Um, so it's got to look like one finished piece of art and that's usually just a simple color wash or gradient wash over the top. The second one is um, fonts. It's not just what font you choose, but it's also the the effects. And if you're just starting design and you don't know what to do, you're probably going to, if you didn't put a color wash on the back, you have all these bright colors and your text doesn't stand out, it disappears in the background. So what you think you have to do is add a strong drop shadow or add a gradient so that your text is a little 3D. Um, and those are mistakes because it looks badly done. For your font, you want your text with no drop shadow. You want your text to stand out against the background. So you can either just darken that area behind the text and have light text, or you can lighten the area behind the text and have dark text. But it has to stand out naturally without you being able to see that there's a sharp um, a difference between the text and the background. It shouldn't look like you glued the text on top of the book cover to look like the text is all part of the art. So it just kind of fits naturally into the art. Um, And the third one, the third one's probably about the text. A lot of authors, they can't decide if their series title or their title is the important part, or if their tagline is important, or if their subtitle is important. So they probably put on a lot of text, and the text just covers their picture. So you look at it and you read the text, but you don't see the picture. The cover, because it's about making an immediate emotional connection, the text isn't really important on the cover. Because they can see the text beside the cover in the Amazon description. They can read the title and the subtitle. So even if that text is really small and not clear, that's fine, because all it has to do is catch their attention. Um, So for me, I'll put the series title, I'll put the tagline, I'll put a review, but it'll be really small text. I'll make the title probably pretty big, but it depends on the genre. Um, for some, you don't want a huge. A lot of indie authors, because there's that rumor that the thumbnail has to be, like everything in the thumbnail has to be readable when it's really small on Amazon. But people don't squint and look at all that little tiny text on Amazon. They'll click on it and they'll look at the big cover. And if you click on a thumbnail, a lot of indie covers, they use huge text. So when you click on it and it opens up, it's just like screaming at you, really big, loud text, and it ruins the effect. The most important thing is the picture, and it's the art, and it's the feeling. So make sure you're not covering up or killing that feeling by trying to fit all the text in, because they won't read the text on your cover. They'll just look at the picture, and then they'll read your text on the side. Mm. No, those are great. I think it's um, it's funny, and I like the uh, ebook cover design awards on uh, the bookdesigner.com, because mm-hmm. You know, it, and I always feel a bit sorry for some some of the people who've submitted, you know, shocking covers. 
<laughs> but it's a really good way to kind of, you know, get a look at a whole load of them at the same time. And I know you've won lots of those uh, awards and things, but it, it's you've got as an author, you have to look at all of this stuff. You have to be aware. Um, but then moving on from that, so people know they need a good designer. How do they find a good designer to work with, um, you know, over time? How, you know, is there a personality type that fits with a certain type of designer? Let me comment first on the previous thing you said, which was the Cover Design Awards. Mm -hmm. um, because the big problem I see happening a lot is that indie authors will design their own covers and then they'll post on Facebook and they'll say, which of these four covers do you like, or do you like my cover? And everybody's going to say, it's beautiful, I love it, you know, or maybe change this and this and this. But um, the people who, if you ask someone for feedback on your cover, they'll look at it in a very different way than they would if they saw it on Amazon. So you don't really know from their feedback if, if it would have worked on Amazon or not. And probably, if people are giving you feedback and they know you, then they're not going to give you honest feedback. You really need to put it somewhere where nobody knows you so that people can be really critical and honest. And that's why I appreciate Joel Friedlander's Cover Design Award so much, is because he actually gives real feedback. If your cover is really ugly, he's going to say, this is a crappy cover, it needs to be redone. And most people won't tell you that, so I think that's really valuable. Um, I made a website a couple months ago called Does My Cover Suck? I think it's called Does My Cover Suck? And it's kind of like a hot or not rating system. So you can upload your cover and people can click whether or not it's, you know, on a scale of 1 to 10 how good it is. Um, and most covers, there's probably three or 400 covers on there. Most of them are like 2 or 3 out of 10. So that gives you kind of pretty obvious advice that you need to try harder. I think at least you should get um, above 5, which means that out of hundreds of people, most strangers think it's okay, it's, you know, it's not terrible. I think that's a goal to go for. And right now I think indie, indie covers are still below that, that mediocre mark. A lot of them are still pretty bad. Mm -hmm. um, okay, finding a cover designer. It's tricky because I don't think it's really about the working relationship. Because you can find someone you really like who is nice and you get along with really well, but that doesn't mean they can give you a good cover. Mm -hmm. And so you might, you know, they might do everything you wanted, and they were really patient, and they listened to you, and they, they did all the changes you wanted, but you don't want to be the one telling your designer what to put on the cover, because you don't really know what sells books, and you're going to make a lot of bad choices. So, like, the more easygoing your designer is, usually, like, when you start out, you want to please the client. So they'll do whatever you tell them to, but that doesn't mean you're going to get a good cover. Um, and that's part of the problem, because authors might think, this guy was great, he did just what I asked, my cover must be awesome, everybody go check out my cover designer, he's, he's amazing. But you may not have gotten a, a nice cover that you're just going to sell the book. And what I see happening, the, the designers who really, whose work sells books, those are the writers who make money, and so they write more books, and they come back to the same designers, and they get more covers. And so, like, I've been in business, I don't know, three years, and a lot of my clients are the same clients I've been working with for several years, and they write a lot of books because they're making money, and so they need new covers. Mm. Um, the cover designers who are okay at making cover designs, they probably get a lot of business, so their prices keep going up. And I was really uncomfortable when I started. I was charging two or three hundred dollars for a cover, and I felt really uncomfortable once I started getting up over five hundred dollars a cover. But I had too much demand; I couldn't handle it. And now I'm up pretty high. I mean, I'm, I'm probably at the high end of the of the scale of of how much you pay for book covers. And probably you shouldn't pay for someone like me to design your cover unless you already have an audience and you know your book is going to sell because it's an investment. And you don't want to just spend, you know, a lot of money on a book if it's your first book and you don't know if it's very good or if it has a market or how you're going to market it. Because when you're spending money, I think um, the first book you treat like a hobby. So you throw a lot of money at it because it's fun and it's your, your personal project and you don't care because it's not about the money, but you don't earn a return on your investment. And 
when you learn to become, like if you want to be a career author, it means you have to make more money than you spend. That's a, a mandatory rule or else you're going to have to get a job and then you won't be able to write as much. So once you start thinking about you can only spend as much money as you're going to earn back and you have to make sure you earn back the money, when you're more established, you can spend $1,000 on a cover or a few thousand dollars on editing because it's an investment and a better product will sell more books. But when you're starting out, even if you have a perfect product and with a well-designed cover, it might not sell anyway if it doesn't have a market or you don't have an audience to reach. And so, it, I mean, it, it's kind of a, it's risky. But when you're starting, you can get, for nonfiction especially, you can get a very decent cover on Fiverr.com or on 99designs. Even for fiction on 99designs, you can do pretty well. Um, if you're writing a lot of books, I just hired someone on, I hired someone from the Philippines for 300 US a month who was working for me 20 hours a week in you know, cover design. And he's a pretty good designer, so he can do five or 10 covers a month for me, which is ridiculous, really cheap. Um, but I can, that way I'll be able to, he'll be able to support me and I can get through more projects faster because mm-hmm. I've had a problem with keeping up with the work. Um, so that's kind of nice. But there's, there's definitely ways you can get very cheap design done. And there's even opportunities for you to do it yourself. I put out a lot of guides, like the DIY book covers website, and I put out templates and instructions. Um, if you're starting from a very good template where everything is kind of okay already, and you can just change the words and change the picture, the finished product will probably be okay. So in some circumstances, it's okay to do it yourself if you have support. But if you're doing it yourself with a design tool that you're not familiar with and you're starting from a blank canvas, that's a big mistake because you'll just put whatever you want and you won't think about what elements have to be there to succeed in your genre. Yeah, so that DIYbookcovers.com, that's, um, that's a great resource. Just explain a bit more what happens there. Um, I started out, I was inspired by Joel Friedlander's templates because he made some interior formatting templates which were pretty cool and I was already kind of trying to find a way to make templates for book covers that authors could use and the problem is it, most people make pre-made covers in Photoshop but then you need Photoshop to edit them. And Photoshop is difficult to learn and it's expensive. Um, so I was trying to find some way authors could just open my templates and make a cover. So I made a lot of covers in Microsoft Word because most authors already have Microsoft Word installed on their computer. Um, and that worked pretty well. It's not foolproof, but most people are comfortable with Word so they can open my templates and they can make a, a cover that's actually pretty good. I've seen some surprisingly good results from people making their own covers with my templates, so that's nice. But the last six months I've been making an online book cover design tool, which is kind of like Canva, Canva canva.com, which is an online graphics editor. And there's a few online graphics editors which are okay, and Canva is very beautiful, but the problem with Canva is there's not a lot of font choices, so designing for certain genres, like a paranormal romance, they might not have fonts that are going to appeal to readers of paranormal romance. And Canva's flat design, so you can just have one layer. And for a lot of, for most fiction book covers, you're going to want to be able to blend layers. So you need to put like a landscape and then a couple on top so that you have different layers and you have to blend them together. And then you have to make them really powerful by putting over like a, a layer mask, a color mask, or gradient, or some texture for like a, a darker, grittier cover for thriller or um, horror. You need to have like the, the texture and the dirtiness on the edges. That's stuff you can't do with Canva. So I made this online tool in Flash that has all those features, which is kind of exciting. Right now, I haven't made the template yet, so they can, people can play with it, but they don't really know what to do with it because I haven't finished the templates. But when I finish all the templates, they'll be able to just click and open a template for a certain genre, and most of the effects will already be there, so they can just um, change things, and they don't need any software, they don't have to download anything. So that's exciting. Yeah, is it And I'm still working on it, but that's exciting. Is that going to be at DIY Book Covers, or somewhere else? 
DIYbookcovers.com, the tool is already there, so you can find it and play with it. And there are some instruction videos. It's like anything else, um, but we actually, we had an event. Uh, the event you in a couple of days ago was the March to Bestseller event. And when I was on there, I posted a challenge. I gave away three or four really nice stock photography, and I asked people to go on my tool and try it out. And there were five or six people who, in a half hour, could make their own cover. That was pretty decent. I mean, better than a lot of do-it-yourself book cover, you know, things that I've seen. So I was, I mean, the opportunity is there. I think the value will be in the templates, because after I'm able to make the templates, then they'll have a strong basis to start from. But even as just an online tool for doing design, I think it's probably going to be one of the better options. And um, the nice thing also is that I made it so you can change sizes, so you can set it for a 6x9 cover or a 5x8 cover, but you can also set it for a Facebook banner or a Twitter header or ad boxes or a custom size. So you can make anything once you get used to using the tool. Wow. Um, and if you've used to, like if you're a little intimidated by Photoshop, it's a lot like Photoshop, but I tried to simplify it. Mm. And so I think like you'll have to learn how to use it, but I think it'll only take a day or two and then you'll have a lot more power to do your own design. So wow. I'm finishing up that project and that's kind of exciting. That is exciting. And and then I had another question because we, we're coming to the end. I could talk to you all day, you know that. But um, I do want to ask you because you, you do so many of these tools. You know, you've got so many ideas and you have ideas and then you make new stuff for people. You're always giving away stuff for free. You're very entrepreneurial. I know you've got ideas about a Chinese language ebook publishing site, a castle for writers retreats in Europe. I mean, <laughs> your, your ideas go on and on and on. I was going to ask you. If authors want to be more entrepreneurial and you know do this stuff, um, how would you suggest they do that? How do people become more entrepreneurial? Okay, it's a very good question, and it's really important for authors because I think the problem with almost all authors is there's this myth of artistic creation based on some very popular books that I won't mention by name, but you probably know. Um, which say you should tune out the world and don't think about the final reader, don't think about selling, don't think about a product, don't think about marketing, just go into your own little cave and produce whatever you feel inspired to produce. That's, it's good advice for helping you to finish the work because you need inspiration to finish the work and sometimes it's hard to get motivated. So you kind of have to believe in that to finish the work. But what happens is you'll finish something that nobody wants. And then you'll try to market it, and marketing doesn't work if you have a product that nobody wants. And that's the big problem that almost all authors are facing, is because they're marketing a product they made without thinking about the end user. Um, and that's what I did when I was an artist and a writer for many years, until I figured it out. When you think about who's going to enjoy what you're making, it's not selling out. It's not necessarily you know, giving up on your dream, your passion. It's kind of, it's smart business, but it's also the entrepreneurial mindset. It's just, instead of thinking about what do I want to make, which is ultimately very selfish, you're thinking about what value can I produce that other people will enjoy? How can I make something that other people will like and cherish and value? If you can think that way, that's the entrepreneurial mindset. And you're just thinking, how can I improve other people's lives? If you're writing fiction, how can I... You know, how can I reach the maximum amount of people? And probably maybe you hate paranormal romance, but if you're writing something obscure or literary, the readership may be like a hundred times bigger with paranormal romance. It doesn't mean you have to write a cheap garbage paranormal romance. You can write a very good one using the skills you know, and it's just you're reaching more people. So your chances of being very successful just by the amount of readership are, are so much bigger. Mm. Um, but that's really the entrepreneurial mindset. For me, because I do covers, I mean, I was doing book editing, so now I have a couple of book editing business websites. I do book covers, but then they need they need author websites, they need marketing, um, they need know, to know how to do this stuff, but they don't really want to learn it all themselves. They really want to just find a good, cheap solution and pay someone to do it. 
and I've been avoiding that for a while, but now I'm starting to make some of those things. Before I was just making do-it-yourself tools and resources, so I could just send people mm -hmm. to go do it themselves, and I could focus on what I'd like to do, but I realized that doesn't cut it for everybody. A lot of people, they still don't want to learn how to do it, they just want to pay someone but there aren't a lot of really good options, like for book marketing, there's a lot of places you can spend money, but there's not a lot of things that really work. Mm -hmm. So it's, but there should be, I mean, there should be somewhere where you can pay to have someone market your book and it would increase sales, like that should be a, an option. Mm -hmm. um, I think entrepreneur is really just in producing value. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important. I think if you want to be a career writer, um, I'm kind of excited, I just hired two girls in the Philippines to write romance novels for me and I'm paying them like $150 a month for 20 hours a week which could be 80,000 words of content a month. They're both like near fluent, they're both, um, one of them studying literature, she's brilliant, her writing is really good, the other one's younger and has more like the teenage girl style of writing but I mean over the next year, I'll have them both put out a book a month and I'll give them feedback. So by the end of the year, they'll both be pretty decent writers because I'll I'll have coached them through this process of being better writers. And then if they can both put out a romance book every month that's pretty decent and I can make covers, um, it's, a, it, it's kind of a... I don't think there's anybody else who's outsourcing fiction writing in this way and treating it as a business, but I think it's going to be pretty successful. So... Well, and, and this is the that. thing. I know some people will be like, "Ah, no, that's just scandalous to do something like that." But, but this is where it comes down to what the individual wants to do as a creative work in the world. So, um, you know, your business model is delivering things that people want, uh, and you do so, so many different things, as I said, you know, and um, and. I had, you know, I have had people, even my husband has said, why don't we just pay somebody to write the books for you? <laughs> and I was like, well, no, that's not really my point. My point for me is that my, what I enjoy is saying I made this. So, mm -hmm. you know, that that's part of why I'm writing the books. But no, it's really interesting to hear you say that. Um, and then, what you know, what, what, oh, the other thing I was going to say is fear of failure. You don't seem to have any fear of failure. Um, you just do stuff, and if it doesn't work, you just give it up, right, and do something else. Yeah. Um, do you have fear of failure? Interestingly, <laughs> the point I was about to make was, it seems like they're polar opposites, doing what you love and making something meaningful and making something people want. But I don't think they're polar opposites. I think you can look at what's a popular genre. Um, romance is a popular genre. If you're making something people want, it doesn't mean you're going to make total crap that's a copy of everything else. You can look at the features that everything in that genre has, and you can still write a better book than anything else on the market. But you're, you're doing it knowing there's a big readership. So it's, a much, it's much less of a risk. I think that's part of why... I don't have a feel of failure anymore is because I don't do things that aren't going to be successful. And I think that's pretty easy to do if you look at, I mean, before the things I was painting and the things I was writing, there wasn't a big readership. Even if I had done them very, very well and been successful in that endeavor, they wouldn't have been hugely best-selling popular fiction books. Um, now the stuff that I work on, I know there's a market, I know people want it and need it, I know that I can produce pretty good quality. So I mean there are some things that might not work, I mean these girls in the Philippines maybe their writing will never be very good, but I also see, I mean in the romance category, there's about 50 really good and then there's you know a couple hundred books that aren't very good that still sell and make a lot of money and they're not you know qualitatively fantastic fiction, but people still enjoy them and, and value them. Um, I think these girls in the Philippines can write something as good as those, mm. and if they're writing you know, 20 a year, that's, that's creating a lot of value. But I also don't think I could just purely outsource it because people would distrust my, my own platform. And so I also put out a lot of my own books, my own nonfiction. Mm. I'm writing a novel now that I hope I'll finish by the end of the year, and that'll be my first published fiction, so that's kind of exciting. Um, 
because I can't really, I mean, I give a lot of advice about publishing, but the people who are business oriented and talking about how to make money as an author, they're mostly talking about nonfiction because it's much more complicated to talk about how to market your fiction books. Yeah. And there aren't a lot of leaders doing that because the people who are making money with fiction books, they probably have very good books or they have a big platform. They don't necessarily know how they sold a lot of books. And they might think they know, but it, it, they can't really spell it out. It's usually because they have good books. So even if you do everything they did, you might not have the same kind of success. So I'm hoping once I have more of my own fiction books that I can market, I can really develop a system that works for marketing fiction, that works for you know a lot of people. So we've got to finish. So where can people find you and you, all your work online? Um, Creative Indie is my main blog, and that's kind of my hub where I blog about everything. I have like probably 20 other websites now that I'm developing that are kind of half done, and then I have my book cover site and my DIY book covers and other things, but most of them you can find from my main site. So I go there first. Fantastic. Thanks so much for your time, Derek. That was great. Mm -hmm. Nice to talk to you in person.